Good morning, One Church. Hey, I miss you so much. Even those that I didn't think I would miss, I miss you too, because uh, it's been a while since we've been able to gather, and we are all looking so forward to being able to gather soon. Uh, this is actually our sixth week in a row of holding all of our service 100% online. Uh, this has been an interesting time in our world, an interesting time in the life of our church, uh, but it's also been an opportunity for us to extend our church family. Uh, there have been so many of you who maybe before this all started, you never even heard of one church before, let alone set foot in one of our buildings. And uh, now you're part of the family. Uh, For many more of you, this might be your very first time tuning in online. And to those, I say welcome. We're just honored to have you as a guest here this morning. Uh, Last week was Easter Sunday, and Easter Sunday we began a brand new series called How Sweet the Sound. And I know a lot of you are going to love this, but during the course of this series we are talking about different hymns, uh, many of which are hundreds of years old. And uh, we're going to kind of break those down a little bit, tell you a little bit of the backstory of the hymn, and then uh, just talk about the theme of the hymn. So last week, Easter Sunday, we started off with Amazing Grace, uh, probably the most famous hymn of all time. Uh, And by the way, if you missed that week, uh, last week, you can just go on our website, onechurchny.com. You can find all of our messages there, uh, especially last week, or you can find it on Facebook as well. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about the hymn, the one that we just sang, What a friend we have in Jesus. And I believe this hymn is one of the most perfect songs and hymns to reflect on uh, during this time of crisis in our lives. Because one of the things this song talks about several times, and and we'll show some of the lyrics again in just a moment, uh, but it talks about the theme of prayer. Uh, One of the most basic Christian disciplines in our life, prayer. What is prayer? prayer. If I, if I were to ask 10 different people for a definition of prayer, chances are you would get 10 different definitions. Uh, and if I were to ask 10 different people what prayer means to you, chances are I would get 10 different answers to that as well because uh, we all have a different view of prayer. We have a different background on prayer. Uh, for some of us, prayer, we would say, is an essential part of our life. Others would say prayer is something that uh, maybe you you care about, but you don't do all that often. Uh, For some, you'd just say, hey, I I just, I don't pray. That's just not something I do. Uh, For others, prayer seems like a chore at best and ineffective at worst. Others would say you have seen the power of prayer and you rely on it on a daily basis. Uh, So before we talk about what prayer is and how we can apply this to our lives, I first want to talk about some common misconceptions about prayer. The first one is this, is prayer is complicated. Uh, I I think humans, we have a tendency to overcomplicate as much things as possible. Um, Prayer is definitely one of those things that we have overcomplicated in our lives. Uh, depending on your church background, or maybe you don't have any church background, uh, you, you may have grown up believing that prayer requires us to use like certain words. Uh, for example, maybe you heard someone pray prayers like this, uh, thou with prayeth unto thee, O holy father of me, the holy trinity, be a hedge of protection over humanity. You, you like all the rhymes in there? I, I rhyme quite a bit. I could turn that into a little rap if I wanted to. Uh, maybe that's a little extreme. But maybe that's kind of how you pictured it. Just this really formal thing, this formal way of communicating to God. Uh, For me, it wasn't so much about the words that I heard and the words that I thought we had to use during prayer. Uh, For me, it was the rules that I thought existed around prayer. Uh, I've had people tell me before that uh, to be an effective prayer, you had to pray for at least an hour, preferably in the morning, on your knees and hands like this. And I'll just be honest, this whole idea of praying for an hour has been really tough for me. Uh, there are, has been a lot of guilt and shame in my life because I'm just not someone who can pray for an hour straight. Uh, and then I saw a movie one time of someone praying in a prayer closet. And I, I looked through my closets. I'm like, I, I have no room in any of my closets to pray. And I just felt like a failure in my prayer life. 
So these rules have always been hard for me. And then as if I didn't already feel like a failure, uh, I would end up in these small groups or maybe pastor meetings with some really good prayers. And maybe you've heard them before, like professional prayers. They know every name of God. Uh, They can quote scripture from the King James Version, and they know exactly what chapter and verse these verses are in. And that's, I mean, that is just not me. I can quote scripture, but I don't always know what chapter and verse it is, and I might not have it word for word. That is just not me. I mean, honestly, I have a hard time remembering everyone's prayer requests in a small group meeting. So when I hear these people pray, I just come to the conclusion that I don't have the gift of prayer. See, we overcomplicate things when it comes to prayer, and we'll talk about why this doesn't have to be the case just in a little bit. We'll come back to that. So that's the first misconception. The second misconception is this, is that prayer is boring. Uh, Last week, during Holy Week, I I was reading through the Gospels, and I was reading through uh, kind of the end of Jesus' ministry when uh, he was going, getting ready for his death and resurrection, and uh, one of the things that would happen is Jesus would go away to pray. He would come back and his disciples would be sleeping. I don't think I've ever related to Jesus' disciples more than in those stories. Uh, One of the things Danielle and I, we do together, not every single night, but on a pretty regular basis, is we pray together. And we started this uh, over 11 years ago when we started dating. And uh, I remember early on when we were still in that stage of talking on the phone for hours and hours and uh, talking until we got too tired to talk anymore, sometimes well past midnight or even one in the morning. Uh, We would end our time on the phone in prayer. And one time... uh, I should back up just a second. So there's these stats out there that say the average man speaks 7,000 words a day and the average woman speaks about 20,000 words a day. And then I read something else that says Greek women, which my wife is Greek, speak about 30,000 words a day. And that is so reflected in our prayers. Well, one time, so I, I pray first and mine's short to the point, short and sweet. And then Danielle's, not so much. <laughs> she, she would pray a little bit longer, which is great. I love that. But at one in the morning, like I'm just ready for bed. And I fell asleep while she was praying. She caught me. And then there was another time, I kid you not, I fell asleep while I was praying. All of a sudden, I started rambling incoherently. And I end the prayer saying, high five. And Danielle thought I was having a stroke or something. She didn't know what was happening. But I had fallen asleep while I was talking. I don't know why she didn't break up with me right there, but some of us, we just get bored thinking about praying. Like if we have a hard time sleeping, that is what we go to to try to fall asleep. Or maybe that's not you. Maybe you just have a little bit of ADD when you try to pray. We have a hard time focusing. Like, God, I pray for my friend John. He, he really needs you, which reminds me, I, I really need to pay that bill. Uh, I, you know what? I, I should just make that uh, put a little to-do list on my phone. And you know what? While I'm on my phone, I'll check Facebook and see how John is doing. See if he may be connected with you, Lord. And before we know it, we've spent 27 minutes watching YouTube videos. We made that to-do list. We answered some emails and we prayed for maybe 20 seconds. I, I don't know about you, but I've been there before as well. So we might think prayer is complicated. We might think prayer is boring. And then some of us, we just simply think prayer doesn't work. We might think prayer doesn't work. Maybe we've tried before, but if it worked, then why didn't God fill in the blank? And those fill in the blanks are really important things to us. Maybe it's someone who got sick and we were praying for healing, but they passed away anyways. Or a relationship that fell apart. We just come to the conclusion that prayer must not work. So if you find yourself in one of those three categories, maybe thinking that prayer is boring, that it doesn't work, that it's complicated, this message is for you today. Because I don't believe that we are praying to a distant, uninvolved, uncaring, hard to please God. I believe that we are praying to a loving and caring and a personal God who calls us friend. Look at what John, or I'm sorry, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, John 15, 15. He says this, he says, But I call you my most intimate friends, 
He's talking to his disciples, but he's also talking to us. For I reveal to you everything that I've heard from my father. Jesus refers to us as one of his most intimate friends. And it was these words of Jesus that helped inspire that famous hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And I want to share with you just a little bit of the backstory about this hymn, because when you know the context in which the author was writing this, it just makes this hymn even more beautiful. So just a few facts about this hymn. Uh, The hymn was written by a man named Joseph Scriven in the mid-1800s. Joseph, he grew up and he lived in Ireland. Uh, When he was in his early 20s, he was in love and he proposed and he was planning on getting married to the love of his life. The wedding was planned. As you can imagine, uh, this couple was excited. They were looking forward to what life would look like, just uh, being married together, uh, living together. And the day before the wedding, they were riding their horses to meet each other. So they're on their way, on their own, riding their horses to meet each other. And his fiance, uh, she's riding along the riverbank. The horse bucked, threw her off the horse. She fell, she hit her head, and she rolled into the river unconscious, and she drowned. Joseph arrived just minutes later, just a little bit too late to find the love of his life. After this, he became uh, somewhat of a wanderer. He was just trying to deal with and cope with uh, what had just happened. So he started to wander around the world and he ended up living in Ontario, Canada, uh, right on Lake Ontario, actually. And while living there, he gave his life to Jesus. He became a Christian. In fact, he was so moved by the word of God and specifically the Sermon on the Mount that he dedicated his life to poverty. He wanted to just to serve people. Any money that he got or possessions that he got, he just freely gave to the poor. Uh, he was quite a talented uh, craftsman and he would work for people, only for people who couldn't afford to hire anyone else. He was known in his town. His nickname was the Good Samaritan. It was said that he never turned down an opportunity to serve others. And uh, Joseph, he, as life's going on, he fell in love again in his later 20s. He proposed, he was engaged again. Things were going well for Joseph. And then weeks before this wedding, his fiance got pneumonia and passed away at the age of 23. A few years later, when Joseph was in his 30s, uh, he received news that his mother back in Ireland, uh, that she had fallen ill and that she wasn't going to make it. And uh, because of his vow of poverty, he just didn't have the money to go visit her before she passed. So rather than visit her, he decided to write her a poem. The poem was meant to comfort her, and it was eventually put to music and named, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It became well-known all over the world. However, Joseph never took credit for it. It was several years later, uh, one of Joseph's neighbors was at his home and he noticed some writings on his desk. And it was the words, the original words that he penned to the song, what a friend we have in Jesus. And he asked Joseph, Joseph, did you write this? And Joseph responded, he said, well, the Lord and I wrote it together. Here are some of the words to this song, some of these beautiful, knowing the backstory of this. Look at what he says. He says, have we trials and temptations? Is there any trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we fr- find a friend so faithful who with all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Every line of this poem, which became a song, ends with talking about taking our burdens, taking our temptations, our trials, our weaknesses to the Lord in prayer. Prayer is the theme of this hymn, and it was a defining characteristic of Joseph's life. What Joseph endured, the pain and the tragedy he endured, is possibly more than most of us can even dream of experiencing. But he was still comforted and dependent on prayer and this intimacy he had with his God. James, who was the brother of Jesus, said this in James 5.16. He said, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. 
See, what Joseph Scrivens believed and what the Bible teaches is that prayer is powerful and effective. But again, for us, prayer can be difficult because we make it complicated. We think it's boring and we think it is ineffective in our lives. So let's talk about what prayer is and how we can pray. What prayer is and how we can pray. The first thing is this, how do we pray to God? Sometimes we talk to God. Paul, who was the apostle, who uh, who was a Christian hater, became a Christian himself. He said this when writing from a Roman prison, He says this in Philippians 4, 16. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. He says, pray about everything. So how do we pray to God? We simply talk to him. Does it have to be early in the morning for an an hour on our knees like this in our prayer closet? It could be, but it doesn't have to be. Prayer is simply talking to God. Paul said in another letter that he wrote to the church in Thessalonica, he said to pray without ceasing. That can sound a little intimidating. Like how do we pray without ceasing? How do we never stop praying? The, the best example I have of what this can look like is how I communicate with my wife, Danielle. In many ways, Danielle and I, we talk without ceasing. Now we're not just talking for an hour straight all the time. We're just in constant communication. Sometimes it's in person, sometimes it's on the phone, sometimes it's through text messages throughout the day. Uh, When we're apart, we're texting back and forth. They're not these deep thoughts all the time. Sometimes it's just seeing how each other is. Uh, If one of us is working, the other one will send a picture of our daughter and uh, we'll just say that we love each other. We'll say what we're feeling inside. It's just this constant miniature communication throughout the day. That's also how I pray. It's not always this long, drawn-out prayer. Sometimes it's just a simple, thank you, God, for this beautiful scenery in my backyard. God, thank you for what you're doing in my life. God, I need your help with what I'm about to walk into. God, I'm going into a meeting. Please give me the words to say. Sometimes it's a simple, I love you. See, here's the truth for my prayer life. This is just me being honest. I very rarely pray for a long period of time. However, I very rarely go a long period of time without praying. We can, we can pray without ceasing, without just setting aside a straight hour throughout the day. It can just be this constant communication, this constant awareness of the presence of God. I believe that's what Paul meant when he said pray without ceasing, this constant conversation. So how do we pray? Sometimes we talk to God. The second thing is this, is that sometimes we vent to God. Sometimes we vent to God. Uh, Question for you. Who is one person that you vent to? Most of us, we have that one or maybe two people that we just vent to. Chances are it is one of your closest friends. Maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a family member, but chances are the person that we choose to vent to is the person that we trust the most. Because we know that by us venting to them, they're not going to judge us for how we're feeling. They're not going to maybe even try to fix every little problem. We just know they are a good listener and we can trust them. I know in my prayer life, I have a tendency to try to clean up my prayers before I bring them to God. As if like I'm afraid that he doesn't want to hear anything negative. He just wants to hear my thanks and the things that I really need in life. Like, and and I try to come to God with these prepared and cleaned up prayers. As if God was my boss or just my king or only my creator. And he is our king and our creator. But he also refers to himself as our father and our intimate friend. It is okay to vent to God. Look at what Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 7, one of his disciples. It says, give all your worries and cares to God. It doesn't say just give some of them or give the light ones or give the clean ones. He says, give all of your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. A great example of this is King David in the Old Testament. Uh, David, we just spent a whole series in our Goliath Must Fall series talking about King David who went to fight Goliath and he became the second king of Israel, just a man after God's own heart. 
If you read the Psalms that David wrote, you might be surprised by the honesty that are in them. Sometimes you read through it and David just comes across as a complainer. Sometimes he comes across as a really angry guy because he's, he's wishing these horrible deaths on his enemy and these heartache on his enemy. But it's such a great example of this idea of giving our worries and cares to God. And I believe that God wants us to vent to him. See, he already knows what's going on in our heart. He just wants us to be honest with what we're going through. If we're angry, just give it to God in prayer. If we're worried, let God know. Let him comfort us. So sometimes we talk to God. Sometimes we vent to God. The third thing is this, is sometimes we listen to God. John 10, 27, Jesus says this. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. Uh, we are the sheep in the story, by the way. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. So the question is, are we hearing from God? Now we could spend an entire message and probably an entire series on this idea of hearing the voice of God. But let me just give you a couple things to think about. First, is there enough space and margin in our life that if God were to speak to us, we would be able to hear? Honestly, this has been a real challenge in my life recently. With everything going on, with our whole routines and everything that's normal in life just completely upside down right now, uh, this has been very difficult for me because uh, my life is pretty busy right now probably as busy as it's ever been. And the little bit of free time I have, I've just been spending a little bit too much on Facebook or Twitter or reading the news or watching press conferences because I have this fear that I'm gonna miss something if I'm not just constantly looking at the stuff. And I've been trying a lot better to just to get some time away from my phone. See, it's really hard to hear from God when the noise around us in our life is at a high volume. When just there's all this static noise just going on around us, it is really difficult to hear the voice of God. But here's some good news. There is this new feature on the phone, and I want to show this to you. This is just, I'm going to ask the camera person to just zoom in a little bit because this is groundbreaking and revolutionary. Check this out. Now, I don't know if this works on the Android, but this works on the iPhone. So you can, let me unlock my phone. So you can check this out. If you hold these buttons, there's this feature. You can turn your phone off. It, I mean, it is groundbreaking. I never knew this was even possible, but we can do this. And I'm not saying be a hermit. I'm not saying turn your phone off for a week. That probably isn't the wisest thing to do right now. But my guess is you could use an hour a day where you're not in front of a screen. I know I can use an hour a day where my phone is off, where I'm just with my family, where I'm spending time with God. I can almost guarantee that if you do this, you will be more attuned to what God is trying to speak into your life. My guess is your worry might decrease a little bit if you do this. And so that is just one practical thing that you can do. Uh, another question that comes up, though, is like when, when it comes to God speaking to us in our lives, how does God speak? And again, we could spend a lot of time talking about this. God can speak in all sorts of ways. He's, he's the Alpha, the Omega. He can do anything he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. Some have heard God speak audibly. I'm not one of those people, but I believe others have. Uh, God can speak to us through people, through a message, through a song. He can speak to us through circumstances. Like if a door opens or closes, that could be God speaking to us. But I just want to give you a guaranteed way that you can hear from God. Guaranteed way that you can hear from God. And that is simply to read your Bible every day. We believe that the word of God, we believe that this Bible is the living and active word of God. It says this in Hebrews 4.12. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God is living and active. A, a guaranteed way to hear from God is read the word of God. We want to hear the voice of God. The good news is that is he has already spoken. 
We can hear from God whenever we want. So sometimes we talk to God, sometimes we vent, sometimes we listen. The fourth thing is this, is all the time we give thanks to God. All the time we give thanks to God. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul did from the Roman prison where he wrote Philippians. Here's the verse we read earlier, Philippians 4, 16. says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done. Now look at the next verse, verse 17. Then you will experience God's peace. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Here's a little exercise for you to do, something really practical. Rate your level of peace. Some of you, you're currently laid off. Some of you, you're worried about your safety or your family's safety. You're you're worried about the economy. I get it. There's a lot of uncertainty in our world right now. And when there's uncertainty, there's almost always worry. So when it comes to your level of peace, just rate it. On a scale of one to 10, what would you say your level of peace is right now? And after you do that, make a list of 10 things that you are thankful for. I guarantee you can figure out 10 things that you are thankful for. And after that, take your list, go to God in prayer for just a couple minutes and thank him for those things. Give him thanks for the good things in your life. And I guarantee you that afterwards, your level of peace will increase. If you say, you know what, I did this, my level of peace didn't increase, do it again, make another 10 things. Make another list. Do this every day if you have to. Let me fill you in on my week and explain how this has helped me and helped to increase my level of peace in my life. So Easter Sunday last week, my mother-in-law wasn't feeling very well. Uh, She had a cough and a sore throat. So uh, Monday morning she woke up and she had a fever. So she got a test for the coronavirus. Uh, Tuesday, she got the results back and she was positive for the coronavirus. She's an ER nurse and she's been taking care of patients who has had this. She's been on the front lines, protecting us, being a hero. And she got this. And so what that means for us is uh, between my wife and I and uh, Danielle's sister and my brother-in-law, we've been uh, taking care of her and also taking care of my father-in-law who's in his 80s and has dementia. So it has been, to say the least, it has been a stressful week. There has, with everything going on and just as busy as we already were, now we have to take care of our parents. Needless to say, our peace was a little low, our worry was a little high this week. And I'm guessing that you've had a similar week. Maybe it looked a little bit different, but You've had a stressful week over this last month and a half. Maybe you're trying to manage homeschooling your kids and then after school activities with your kids and then just being a parent to your kids and then Zoom call meetings and your life is just upside down right now. And the peace level has been a little bit low. Chances are we've all had a week or weeks like this over the past six weeks. My challenge to you is to give God thanks for the little things. I've been doing this every night. Some nights I write it down. Some nights I'm just praying this to God as I'm falling asleep, thanking God for the health of myself, for the health of my wife, for the health of my daughter. Thanking God that uh, there's, uh, with everything we do have to worry about, there's things that we don't have to worry about right now. Thanking God for a roof over our head, for heat, for the fact that even though it's snowing, we live in heated houses, right? That was tough this week. But we've been just giving God thanks for the little things. And I'm just telling you, the level of peace just increases. It it reduces the worry. It allows us to see things from a different perspective. When we can get off of this for a little bit and just focus our minds on prayer, it works. I think Joseph Scrivens was onto something when he said, take it to the Lord in prayer. Joseph, who endured so much heartache in his life, his advice was take it to the Lord in prayer. We're gonna sing that hymn one more time, but before we do, let me just pray for you. 
Father, we thank you so much for this tool that we have, this this ability to communicate with you who's our creator, who's our God, but you are also our friend and our father. God, I ask that with everything going on in our world that you would just give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. God, that you would help us to just have our attention focused on you and not just the news, although that can be helpful, but that we can turn our attention to you, that we can see the things that are good in our lives and we can give you thanks for them, knowing that they came from you. So God, we give you thanks, we give you praise and we give you glory today. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.